Good morning and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Flannery and I'm a member of First Unitarian Church of Honolulu and I will be your worship associate this morning. Unitarian Universalism is a progressive, inclusive faith that welcomes people of many backgrounds and beliefs. Whatever your spiritual beliefs are, you will be welcomed here and challenged to become your best self. We are guided by moral principles and draw inspiration from science, history, and all world religions, and we put our values into action. As we gather in worship today, we are intentionally gathering in community, making this a holy and sacred space. Thank you for being with us here today. And is there, are there any kids who want to come up and light the chalice? Eve, you want to come up? Okay. As you light our chalice, please join me in saying, we light this chalice with the embers of compassion. We light this chalice with the torch of justice. We light this chalice with the radiance of joy. So now is our time for Story for All Ages. So if there's any kids out there, young, young at heart who want to come up to the carpet, I invite you guys to come on up to hear the story. So today we're talking a little bit, Jennifer's going to be talking to us later today about power and a little bit about globalization. And globalization is a really big word and it's kind of a complicated idea. But does anyone know what it means? No? So we live in Hawaii, which is one state of the United States. The United States is one country in this whole big world called our Mother Earth. So there's a lot of people spread all over that Earth. And because of a lot of technology like airplanes and telephones and the Internet and Skype. Do you guys ever Skype with your family members? Yeah? Uh, because of technology like that, it's a lot easier to keep in contact with all of those people all over the world, which is really exciting. But it's also really important that we make sure that we're thinking extra hard about how we interact with all those people and how we interact with our world. So I'm going to share a story with you today that's about our fifth principle, which is, does anyone know the fifth principle? Okay, I'll tell you. So it's all people need a vote. So that's what we're going to talk about in our story for all ages today. So it was a warm summer evening in the glorious time between supper being over and having to get ready for bed. When the fireflies start to appear one by one, three children went outside to play. But what should we play, asked Tabitha, who was the oldest of them all, by four months and two days. Let's play tag, said Alex, who was the next oldest, by two months and 15 days. Let's play hide and seek, said Sheena, who was the youngest of the three of them. Tag, said Alex. Hide and seek, said Sheena. Tag, hide and seek, tag, hide and seek. Stop it, said Tabitha. And she stomped her foot and crossed her arms. Let's vote on it. Sheena looked at Alex, and Alex looked at Sheena, and then they both said, okay. We can have secret ballots and everything, said Tabitha. And she ran inside her house and brought back paper and pencils and a shoebox with a skinny hole cut on top. Have you guys ever voted like that with a shoebox? Yeah. Sheena took her piece of paper and wrote hide and seek in neat and careful letters. Then she folded her paper and put it through the skinny hole in the box. Alex and Tabitha were already done. Right, now we count them, said Tabitha. And she took the lid off the box and unfolded each paper. Tag, hide and seek, tag. It's two to one, so tag wins. Okay, said Sheena. And the three of them played tag until their parents called them inside to get ready for bed. The next night, Tabitha brought the shoebox, and they voted again. It's two to one, announced Tabitha. Tag wins. Sheena sighed. Okay. Tag won the next night, too, and the night after that, and the night after that. Finally, it's not fair, Sheena said. But we voted on it, Alex replied, and that was true. And besides, they lived in a democratic country, and in a democracy, voting is the way to decide. 
It's still not fair, Sheena muttered. And so the next night, when Tag won again, she decided not to play. Oh, come on, said Tabitha. Tag isn't fun with only two people. Tag isn't fun at all, Sheena said darkly. I'm tired of playing Tag. I quit. Tabitha looked at Alex, and Alex looked at Tabitha, and then they both looked at Sheena, who wouldn't look at either of them at all. Then Alex said, well, maybe instead of voting all the time, we could take turns. Sheena looked up. Take turns? Yeah, two nights playing tag because there are two of us like who like to play it, and then one night playing hide and seek because there's one of you. We could start tonight, said Tabitha. We could even play hide and seek for a couple of nights in a row because we haven't played it yet. How's that sound? That sounds great, Sheena said. I'm going to go hide. Me too, said Alex. That means you're it. So Tabitha counted, sometimes fast, sometimes slow, until she got 100, and then she yelled, ready or not, here I come. And on that warm summer evening and the glorious time between supper being over and having to get ready for bed, as the fireflies appeared one by one, the three children played outside until their parents called them home because they came to an agreement with voting and sharing and taking turns. All good ways to play with your friends, right? So now we're going to sing you guys up to your classrooms in RE. Okay, let's make a bridge for our children as we sing them off to their program. come to us from Lindsay Bates. Come, let us worship together. Let us open our minds to the challenge of reason, open our hearts to the healing of love, open our lives to the calling of conscience, open our souls to the comfort of joy, astonished by the miracle of life, grateful for the gift of fellowship, confident in the power of living faith. We are here gathered. Come, let us worship together. I invite you to join me in this responsive reading by the Reverend Ted Gallardo. We are here to derive meaning in our actions. We are here to win our power back over our areas of powerlessness. We are here to deepen our understanding of ourselves in order to strengthen self-discipline. We are here to abolish prejudice with an appreciation for our diversity and differences. We are here to feel our personal power and our capacity to affect the lives of other people. We are here to become teachers to each other. We are here to spend time away from the usual influences and relearn reality. When God gives me the desire, I'm also given the power and means to achieve my goals. I am here to see that my singular life is a gateway to countless possibilities. When I change, the world changes. Over the past month, we have been talking about margins, what it means to take a look at a theology, a theology of marginality, and what it means to also, on the flip side of that, take a look at what's at the center. And whenever I think about the center, I usually think about this thing called power. And when I think about power, I think about who historically has had power in our society and in our world. Can you name some of these groups of people? Kings and politicians, the church, 
Yeah, usually men, right? I mean, you know. Right. Straight, white, male, as a matter of fact, most of the time. I'm sorry? Military, absolutely. So indeed, dictators. <laughs> dictators, which some of the kings could be, right? And some men could be, even in their own household. That's right. Um, I'm sure none of that describes anyone sitting here in the sanctuary today. As benevolent of a dictator as we may think we are. So indeed, there's those folks like Napoleon Bonaparte who wanted to have more and more power and conquer more and more of Europe. There's those religious institutions and bishops, especially when there was no such thing as the separation of church and state. And even today, in places like Iran, the Shah has a considerable influence on the life of the common people. And those two influences, politics and religion, all came into one with this one Showtime TV show called The Tudors, right? Anybody see that? Power and intrigue and drama and sex, of course, all make for a scintillating kind of show. These days, who has control over our lives? Who is really in power anymore? Is it still our elected politicians? And if so, I question why President Obama has such a difficult time governing this country and why we can't get anything passed in Congress. So I beg the question again, is it still the politicians? Is it the religious leaders? I see a lot of shaking heads. Or is it somebody else? Corporations. <laughs> Corporations, right. Well, I don't know how many of you saw um, another series back in the 90s called The X-Files. Remember that? I, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but part of me starts to wonder, is it really the smoking men that control our lives? Are they the ones plotting around a long table over cigarettes to, to think, how can we manipulate the society that we live in. Very intriguing, isn't it? And indeed, if you want to know more about how corporations rule the world, go check out a book called Corporations Rule, When Corporations Rule the World. That's the name of the book. It's by David Corton. I actually won't have time to go over the whole book in detail today, but needless to say, I do want to address this thing called power and who is at the center of power. So whenever I talk about power, what makes power so enticing? Why do people want to have it and want to have more of it? What comes with power? What are, name some characteristics that come with power. You get more choices, perhaps, yeah. Fame, right? You, you get your name published in newspapers and on TV and blasted all over the internet. Wealth, absolutely. Money comes with power oftentimes. The two go hand in hand together. Did someone say control? Yeah. Privilege? So who among us at some point in our lives never wanted any of these things? <coughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> never, you never ever wanted any of those things? OK, well, there's a few saints among us. But for those of us who are honest, we're probably more like. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I go, I go back to another TV show, right? Um, how many of you have seen this animated show called um, uh, Looney Tunes? It's not Looney Tunes. What's it called? Um, not Tiny Tunes either. Help me out here. Well, anyway, they have these two characters named Pinky and the Brain. Oh, yeah. Animaniacs. It didn't have tunes in it at all. Animaniacs, right? So Pinky and the Brain is the story of two Lab mouse, or, or are they rats? I, ca I can't tell the difference between a mouse and a rat. They're lab rats, probably, right? They're, they're huge. And via one of these experiments, Brain's brain suddenly became huge. And so he had a big head, in other words. Ba -dum -bum. And Brain's desire, every single day that he wakes up, became 
Taking over the world. That's right, Megan. So whenever Pinky asks Brian, Brian, uh, Pinky, by the way, is Australian, so I'm trying to get my base Australian impersonation here, um, <laughs> says, so Brian, what are we going to do today? And, uh, after, of course, he says, good eye, Brian. Um, and Brian, the, always, the, uh, the response is always, same thing we do every day, Pinky. We're going to try to take over the world. And good thing it's an animated show, because can you imagine what would happen if a mouse becomes the ruler of the world? Not only would that jack up the prices of cheese, which is not good, but what would be we, be, we humans be subjected to? Yeah? They'd set up traps for us. <laughs> and they'd call in the exterminators for those pesky humans. Anyway, so it made me think about that whole situation of where is the center of power? How does brain go about getting it? And what kind of results does he get out of his thirst and lust and hunger? for more and more power, and to try to take over the world. So this got me thinking about power, and is power necessarily evil? And is power necessarily a bad thing? Back during the 1960s, there was a theology that was born called liberation theology. How many of you have heard of liberation theology? In fact, a few of you have approached me and said, Jonifer, when you are talking about marginalities, how come you never mention liberation theology? Because liberation theology is all about looking at the margins. And originally, it was um, thought of by this guy named Paulo Freire from Brazil, who said that our education system sucks. It's meant to perpetuate this cycle and this vicious cycle of poverty, and it's meant to keep the oppressed down. Because what our education system does, it's just like banking. We're putting and brainwashing all our kids into thinking a certain way and learning a certain way without having them think for themselves and transcend the situation that they were born into. Because you notice that oftentimes, especially in the past, people who were born into power stay in power, and their kids become powerful themselves. We find that to be true even here in Hawaii, where the elites concentrate, try to concentrate the mana amongst themselves by intermarrying, yeah? Oftentimes within their family, so that they would con control, continue to have control and dominance over their society. And so, um, the, the idea is that um, liberation theology is to try to figure out a way for those who are on the margins to somehow have more access to power. And so when translated theologically, and this was picked up on mostly by Roman Catholic priests, and I'm convinced, actually, that as much as he tries to deny it, this current pope from Argentina has been tainted by the liberation theology, right? And the idea of liberation theology is that God has a preferential option for the poor. And how revolutionary and how radical is that? Some might describe it as the C-word communism, right? That it's so close to that. But in, in reality, it, 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 it really is a, a different system because it doesn't say necessarily that we need to give all the rich people's money away for the poor, but it does ask us and invite us to take a look at what is at the center of power and who gets left out of this equation. So why haven't I started talking about liberation theology until now? I think it has one major shortcoming, and that is it doesn't ask the question enough for me anyway of the powerful, of how do we get those in power to give up their power? Right? Is, is that a question that some of you ask as well? And I don't know if it's just because I've been um, a, a UU minister and I realized, as I pointed out last week, that I'm actually in the margins, even within our own denomination, right? That we have been that powerful denomination, whether we re realize it or not. That our history has shown us that there was a Unitarian monarch by the name of King Zygmunt who ruled Transylvania, right? 
And we have had Unitarian presidents, even in this country. And we've had Unitarian judges. We now have a Unitarian member of Congress. And we have Unitarian actors and celebrities, right? We have power. And not to mention the money that we have, you know? We're close to an average of six figures, right? In our denomination, this annual household income. We have power. So how do we deal with that? And how do we use it to liberate those who are still on the margins and those who are still oppressed? According to the song and the hymn we sang earlier, how can we befriend the oppressed or the oppressed befriending? Something like that, right? How do we do that? That became my next question. And I realized that none of us had that choice. Most of us were born into the families that we were born into. And so none of us had a choice as to where we were born, but we do have a choice now of how we can change not just the circumstance that we find ourselves in, but the situation that the world finds itself in as well. So what do I mean by this? We've all heard that whole saying that just because you're rich and powerful doesn't mean you're necessarily happy. Does anybody want to do an autobiography or a biography of Paris Hilton thus far? <laughs> Is that really the kind of life that we want to live? Um, I know it's not the kind of life I want to live. But yet, at the same time, I find myself in that compassionate state saying, oh, these poor rich people, how bereft they are of some of the experiences I've had and some of the people I've met and how much more rich my life has been now that I've been able to not only go at it from the margins, but to also be able to look at the center. So for me, it, liberation falls short because it still has that disconnect and it still has that us versus them kind of mentality, that there's the rich people on one side and poor people on the other. Whereas the way I view it, we all have some kind of power or another. Just by virtue of being born, we have some kind of power, whether we realize it or not. And in America, yes, the ideals of the founding of this country is based solely on the idea that each of us is powerful enough to make our voices heard through something we call a ballot box. And nothing can stop us from voting other than our own volition, or maybe if we lived in Pune and Hurricane Izal, you know, caused havoc on our electrical system and put trees on our roads, maybe that would prevent us from voting, right? But we could vote whether we want to play tag or hide and seek. But the question is not whether we're a tag person or we're a hide and seek person. So my question today for you is it's not a question of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican in power, whether you're a communist or a capitalist, none of that for me matters. What matters most is how we relate to each other. It's the kind and the quality of our relationship with one another, which is why I'm probably more of a process theologian than I'm, I'm a liberation theologian, because process theology says that we're not disconnected from each other. There is no such thing as us versus them. In an interdependent, interrelated, interconnected world, everything is a domino effect. Every action I make has an impact on somebody else. When I change, the world changes. And that even if I find myself in a place of powerlessness, even if I were born to an extremely impoverished, poor family, I too have the capacity to change the world. And even if I am rich and fall on the other end of that spectrum, I too can change the world. And indeed, that is our calling as Unitarian Universalists. We are called to be in right relationship with one another and to change the world so that we would be sharing our power instead of hoarding it. For me, the root of all evil is not necessarily power or money or being in the center. The root of it 
has to do with the scarcity mentality. It has to do with fear. It has to do with us building a wall between each other and not recognizing the common humanity that we share with each other. That is where we need to start. And those are the issues and the problems that we need to be addressing as people of faith. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. Can I get an amen to that? So power isn't necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad. But it's a matter of how we share it with one another. So maybe there's room yet in our world to change the paradigm that we've experienced forever and ever. That power does not necessarily just rest within the politicians, the religious leaders, or the corporations. I'm going to end with the chorus of another song from the 90s. Yes, that does date me because all my references are from the 90s and I got stuck there. Um, but a Canadian singer by the name of Carolyn Ahrens, the chorus goes, so many living for the love of power, wanting more until their final hour. The time has come for us to be part of the ones who find a ruler in the power of love. So rather than going after the love of power, I invite all of us to shift our consciousness and find a ruler in the power of love. Are you with me? Amen and amen. <laughs>